All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Katrina Stevens. I'm an MS4 at SUNY App State and current lead coordinator for GOMI. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We're very excited to learn about medicine at sea today. So those for you, those of you who are new, our mission here at GOMI is to create an educational platform where interested students and healthcare professionals can explore and interact with wilderness and emergency medicine. We work really hard to showcase a di diverse spheres in which physicians as well as other healthcare providers can make an impact and inspire others to think abstractly about the ways we can utilize our careers. Um, we also work really hard to create an international community of wilderness medicine enthusiasts and experts who are committed to promote a diverse and culturally competent environment. Um, that all being said, if there's a particular topic that you'd like to learn about or a speaker you'd like to hear from, please reach out to us. Our email is located on our website, and you can also get in touch with us via our social media. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you join our mailing list. Um, we're going to be continuing to have biweekly lectures this semester. Um, we're going to be showcasing different willingness opportunities um, on our, during our talks, as well as on our website. We'll have a fellowship showcase this semester, and we're going to have a certificate certificate course, and there's more. So if you go ahead and join our mailing list, that'll be the best way to stay up to date with our current um, topics and um, events. And additionally, if you want to watch some of our previous lectures, uh, the vast majority of our lectures are available on our YouTube, so you can go ahead and, and join us there. Um, as well as you can follow our Instagram um, for additional information. And this semester, uh, today's our first lecture. So thank you all for joining us for the first one of the spring. Um, we have a wide range of topics this semester. We're very excited for each one. Um, so make sure you're following us either on the mailing list or on social media so you can stay up to date. And without further ado, uh, Dr. Alchu is joining us today. Um, so. Uh, Lauren's day job is an emergency medicine physician. She's in San Diego, and it gives her plenty of time for a true passion of playing outside. She trained in York, Pennsylvania, and completed her wilderness medicine fellowship at UC San Diego. She came to medicine after years as a ski patroller, a sailor, and a mountain guide, and continues to incorporate these into her practice. She provides education and medical direction for ski patrol and search and rescue teams, and teaches medical school students and outdoor enthusiasts about marine and mountain medicine. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Altshu. Thank you so much. Let me get my presentation up and we'll get rolling. Okay. Well, hi guys. Um, my name is Lauren Altshu. I'm a ER doc here in San Diego. And uh, today we are gonna be talking about medicine at sea um, and some unique topics related to a significant austere environment. So before we get rolling, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my day job is I'm an ER doc. I work at Kaiser San Diego, um, but my true job and the one that my day job really pays for is I'm a wilderness med doc. Um, and that's where, I, that's where my passion lies and that's what keeps me going. And so I, I teach for a variety of organizations um, with the fellowship here at UCSD. Um, I'm also very active in teaching with the diploma in dive and marine medicine and actually just finished mine about two months ago. So I'm super excited about that. And then I also work for a company called Maritime Medical Guides. Um, we do woofer and woofa programs, mostly for offshore sailors. Um, so really cool population of, of mostly non-medical professionals getting their feet wet. In my free time, I also like hanging out at the beach, diving, sailing, snorkeling, and just going for long walks. Um, that's pretty much where you can find me most of the time, um, including this morning. And then in addition to marine stuff, I also um, am a ski patroller. I've been doing that for 20 years, and I work with San Diego Mountain Rescue Team. So I get my mountains and I get my ocean. Um, but this is a, kind of a, a lecture that's come together from a bunch of different topics that I've lectured in the past and have a lot of interest in. And hopefully you guys will have some questions that I can help to, uh, to expand your knowledge and incorporate into, into this talk in the future. So, you know, we've had talks at Gaumi in the past about mountain medicine, about desert medicine, about jungle medicine, and even a few about the maritime environment. But I would argue that for most medical professionals or most lay people, they probably have a lot more exposure to the topics we'll talk about today than they may some of the other ones. Now, there's some folks who really take it to extremes. Um, gentleman on the left kayaked across the uh, Atlantic Ocean three times. 
Um, I'm not going to go that. I'm not going to go that in, uh, far out there. Um, and the gentleman right, unfortunately, was stranded at sea for 133 days. Um, but even those of us that just like to recreate or do uh, participate in closer to shore activities um, can still have relevance on this talk. So 80% of the pop world's population lives within 50 miles of an ocean. So folks who may not consider themselves, you know, often in the marine environment may find that they get exposed to these kinds of issues just by proximity and easy access. In addition, they're surfaced 71% water, so we are the largest of the austere environments on planet Earth. All right, so we're gonna talk about the medical problems that occur at sea, and I'm gonna kind of break it down into five categories um, to hit on some of the common and unique issues that you'll see in this environment. So first off, let's just talk about the marine environment as a whole. All right, so any of you guys who are sailors or water sports enthusiasts may recognize the hands that look like these. So these are salt sores. You can also get uh, boat bum. Um, and basically what happens when you're spending more than a little bit of time in a marine environment, is you're dealing with salt, you're dealing with wind, you're dealing with dry air conditions, and that's going to tend to desiccate our skin and make us prone to skin breakdown. And so using emollients, using topicals that can help to rejuvenate and moisturize our skin is a really key thing when you're on these longer uh, exposure times. In addition, because the skin is our protector from the world, when you have breakdown in your skin, you're more prone to infection. This picture on the right is, uh, is a example of, some, of a story from a guy that I teach wilderness and medicine with in marine medicine. And he's a sailor who likes to go from LA to Hawaii and back. He does the, the pack cups. And one of his crewmates a few years ago was on a sailing trip there about four days out from Honolulu. And he cut his leg. Wasn't a big deal cut, you know, no, wouldn't require stitches or anything if he was, was back on land. But he, he just decided he was going to duct tape it and take care of it. And so he wrapped a bunch of duct tape around it and didn't look at it again for the next four days. And by the time he got to Honolulu, that cut was infected with MRSA. He was septic. And he spent about two weeks in the hospital um, and almost lost the leg because of that. And so, you know, without having areas where you can keep your skin clean, uh, areas where you can protect from all those microbes that live on the outside, uh, we are at higher risk for skin breakdown and infection as he unfortunately figured out. In addition to just the, the water and the air environment, sun exposure is a very, very real concern in the marine environment. Now, hopefully you're not pulling a Will Ferrell uh, and, and uh, going for the full body burn. Although, you know, I think he, uh, the, uh, the drink makes it all better. If you, if you go in that way. But making sure that you're using sunscreen that blocks both UVA, which is the aging and, and wrinkling side of uh, sun damage, and UVB rays, which cause sun burns, is really critically important. And I know like all of you, I probably do not wear enough sunscreen. Um, so basically this rule of thumb up here on the, on the right is you should be applying a full shot class to your body and at least a teaspoon on your face every 90 to 120 minutes. And so I definitely am not uh, one of those folks who uh, listens to my own suggestions on that one. But the sun exposure in a marine environment is something where you really have no protection other than your, your vessel and your clothing. And so it's something we have to think about. Now, one thing I always like to talk about when we're talking about sunscreen, sunburns, is about SPF. Now, so for if you're not wearing any sunscreen at all, you're hanging out on the on, on your boat, um, you're getting 100% of the sun's photons that are getting exposed to your skin, getting the UVA and UVB. When you add sunscreen, what that does is that SPF is a multiplying factor for how long it's going to take for those photons to get through. So, for example, if you burn normally with nothing, no sunscreen on in 10 minutes, if you add SPF 30 sunscreen, you're now covered for... 300 minutes. And that's up to a 93% protection is kind of shown here. But here's the caveat, is that SPF 30 that's gonna give you 300 minutes of protection wears off in about 90 to 120 minutes. And so you still have to reapply because the actual barrier is going away. And so for those of you guys that go out and spend money on SPF 50, SPF 75, it's all kind of a marketing gimmick because it still wears off in the same time. So go ahead and get your SPF 30 or SPF 25, as long as you slather it on enough enough volume, that's gonna help protect you from the sunburn. All right, my third environmental situation 
is seasickness. All right. Not that sexy, not that exciting, but super duper common. Right. So on the seasickness front, basically it's your inner ear and your brain trying to figure out where it is in space. It's basically the same process that goes on in vertigo. Um, we have a couple of medication options for prevention of seasickness. Think about scopolamine patches, dramamine, as well as some treatment options. Methylzine, which we also use for vertigo treatment, and then antiemetics like zofran or phenargan. But a lot of times things you can do to help prevent rolling, help prevent, keep your stomach and your body centered, watching, you know, your position on the boat, looking at the horizon, getting fresh air are all really, really critical in preventing seasickness. Now there's some folks that I hang out with and go sailing with that say, oh, I got an ironclad stomach. I got an ironclad inner ear as well, I guess. And I never get seasick. Now, in those folks' cases, maybe they don't need scopolamine or dramamine on a regular basis. But in high seas or in any situation where you're actually in a small vessel, so for example, if you were had to go abandon ship and you had to go into a lifeboat, go ahead and treat before you go. Because even if, even if you've got a great resiliency, you're not going to respond well to that. And I want to just show you an example of what some of that, uh, that rocking might look like in high seas. And see if you think you'd be seasick after uh, hanging out on this vessel. And this is a storm in, off Ireland, so a fishing boat that was, uh, was going for a little bit of a wild ride. And so even if you're center of the boat, you're, uh, you're trying to get all the fresh air you can, it's going to be hard to keep your, uh, your stomach and your head about you with a little bit of medication support. And even then, it could be a challenge. So seasickness is a very real thing. And I think, oh, you know, this, we don't see sea states like this very often. But definitely, I've taken the ferry to Catalina many, many times um, and had some days when it, it certainly felt like it was it was rocking like this. So very easy to, to imagine that and something you want to have as a prophylactic if you're going to be in a potential environment where you could be experiencing these things. All right. So moving on to the environment to a common and unique um, risk, which is drowning. All right. So drowning is... Very common, unfortunately. Um, as the WHO estimates between 200 and 400,000 deaths worldwide. Now, most of those are in uh, lower income countries and not as well uh, recorded to really give us precise numbers on that. In our pediatric population, it's the second leading cause of, non of accidental deaths. And kids can drown in something as little as a bucket or a bathtub or a toilet, but in open bodies of water and in a marine environment, it is certainly something we need to think of. So let's do a little physiology, okay? Let's talk about how drowning occurs and what happens when we drown. So let's say you get thrown off a boat. Your head gets submerged below water, which is the, by the definition of drowning is submersion of the airway in water. You start to struggle, you start to try and swim so that you're, you're taking little aspirate, little gasps of water when you're doing that, but you're holding your breath. You're trying not to, to take too much water in. You get a gasp. And what, that, what happens when you gasp is you can either go down two pathways. Either you get a laryngospasm, so your throat closes up. The water doesn't go in, which is good, but you also can't get air in. It's a problem. We need oxygen and air, obviously, to breathe. Or the other option is you take a gasp and you end up aspirating water into your lungs. Either way, the body is not happy with either a low oxygen state or a high water state in the, in the lungs. And the main organ systems that are affected are the central nervous system, the cardiac system through the hypoxic arrest potential, and the pulmonary system. Now within the lungs, here's what water does. Now this is fresh water, this is brackish water, this is salt water. The biggest impact it has is actually on surfactant. And if you remember from MS1 year, what surfactant does, it's that chemical that coats the inside of the alveoli and helps keep them inflated, helps keep the balloons open. So when water from the outside hits that surfactant membrane, it actually helps to dissolve it. And when that does, the basement membrane underneath the alveoli is unprotected, and it can actually have a direct assault from the force of the water there. In addition, it sets off an inflammatory process, which further damages your basement membrane. And when you have a basement membrane, which is only supposed to be a cell or two thick, that's now having an inflammatory process, you get swelling, you get edema, you can't get that oxygen blood transfer, carbon oxygen, carbon dioxide transfer across the blood. 
and you end up with an ARTS-like picture. And so this is an x-ray, chest x-ray of someone who has drowned. And for those of you guys who don't read x-rays very often, let me give you a little, little primer here. So lungs, supposed to be black. When you see this white fluffy, fluffy crowd right here, patients either got COVID or they got a heck of a lot of water in their lungs. And waterlogged lungs are just not functional for being able to breathe and being able to do that oxygen transfer that we need to survive. And so because of that, even someone that you pull out of the water quickly and doesn't seem like they've had any serious injury, they actually can develop a serious lung injury in the hours after a drowning episode. And so these are folks we want to watch very closely and make sure to have respiratory support for them if they take a turn in the wrong direction. All right. So cold water immersion, if you happen to drown not in the tropics or the subtropics, has some pros and cons to it, right? So we know from our previous talks about hypothermia, and other gamma lectures on that, hyperthermia and cold can actually be protective for our brain, for our heart, and folks can actually come back from being really, really cold. But if you happen to get cold in the water, you got some extra challenges. So that first minute that you fall in the cold water, your job is to get your breathing under control. When we jump in a freezing lake or we get thrown in the ocean, what happens is we start immediately start to hyperventilate. And that's oftentimes when you're going to get that aspiration, we're going to get that gas, we're going to go down that drowning pathway. It takes about a minute to slow our breathing down and to regulate it so that we can actually be functional. After the, you get your breathing under control, you've got a 10 minute period where you can be useful in self-rescue. That means you've got your dexterity, you've got your fine motor skills. You can climb up on a, a, uh, a piece of a door as uh, Rose did in, in Titanic. And in that 10 minutes, that's where you can, you can save your own life or help your crewmates save your life by getting you into a rescue sling, getting you back onto the boat. And then the last piece of this, the 1101, the one hour is actually how long it takes before you become hypothermic in cold water. And so you have a pretty long time where you may just not be able to grab onto anything and, and help with your rescue before you're actually gonna succumb to the hypothermic piece of this. And interestingly, for folks that are drowning or submerged in cold water, there's this really neat concept called circumrescue collapse. Now, what circumrescue collapse basically is, is you get these folks that have been thrown on a man overboard situation. Their crewmates come around, they pull them out of the water, they're saved, they get back onto the boat, and then they go into cardiac arrest. You go, what the heck happened, right? I thought I was fixed. And it's a combination of a couple things. One is your adrenaline drops off. Right. So when you are doggy paddling, you are treading water for all you can, your cortisol levels are really high and you see that rescuer, your cortisol levels drop. And so you can basically have a decreased cardiac response from that. In addition, by being surrounded by water, you actually have some hydrostatic pressure. And so that hydrostatic pressure is going to help keep blood out of the extremities and into the core. And so when you're lifted out of the water and now standing up, all that blood drops to the feet. And that can be a vagal response that can be triggered. And so there's a, a philosophy and a, a principle of when you're rescuing someone who's coming to the water, especially who's been in cold water, keeping them horizontal. So they don't have that gravity response. They don't have that vagal response. And that help, can help prevent that circumrescue collapse. Now, when you're in the water, there's a couple tricks, a couple positions you can use to help retain heat. One is called the help position. That's this guy on the top. And it's basically the fetal position. You're trying to keep your extremities in. You're trying to decrease your surface area and keep your warm blood and warm, uh, warm energy towards the core. Now, if you're with a couple people, you can do the huddle. In this case, again, trying to get our cores, trying to get that, that warm uh, blood circulating. And what you'll actually end up doing is within the circle, you'll actually warm the water. And so that will actually help to generate heat and keep folks warm. And you can, if you've got a big enough circle, you can put somebody in the middle and trade that person off. Now notice though, all the folks in these diagrams have life jackets. And life jackets are one of the main reasons that folks can survive prolonged exposures in cold water or in, in prolonged exposures in water in general, right? So one of the things I always recommend is a safety thing. And actually as a medical intervention is make sure you're always wearing a life jacket, right? So a bunch of different kinds of life jackets. Um, the ones you'll most often see on like ski boats or recreational boats, so there'll be a type three. Um, if you're talking about offshore, 
um, like a cruise ship, you're going to see a type one or a type two. The differences between them is how much buoyancy they have and if they're designed to turn a person's face upright. So if you go into the water unconscious, your airways turn so it's above the above the surface, as opposed to having your face in the water. So you're going to drown before you get a chance to be rescued. And so when you look at accidents, boating accidents, sailing accidents, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, the percentage of folks that involve folks not wearing a life jacket that end up in fatalities is super high. And so this is one thing we can do preventative and to help, uh, to help save lives in the water. All right. Switching gears a little bit, we're going to talk briefly about some hazardous marine creatures um, and hazardous and, and encounters you may uh, you may go through. Now, when I talk about hazardous marine creatures, the thing that everybody wants to talk about always is sharks, right? I live in, in Southern California. We have thousands and thousands of white sharks right offshore here. See them pretty regularly. Um, Fortunately, they tend to keep their space. We tend to keep our space. But there is there is a non-zero risk of an encounter with a shark. Um, the downside of an encounter with a shark is it can tend to cause some big wounds, right? This example here is a, someone who got bitten in the leg. And these are contaminated, um, lots of tissue trauma, lots of potential for bleeding um, from shark wounds. The good news about shark wounds is the shark's not trying to eat you. They, we are not their prey. Their prey is seals and so and other mammals. And so usually when they're biting us, it's a, a case of mistaken identity. And so when the shark's coming up from below, this is what it's seeing for my surfing friends, right? It's seeing what looks like a seal in the water. And it takes that bite to have its favorite dinner. And then it realizes, oh, that's neoprene and surfboard. That is not my dinner. Um, and so it's going to take off. It wants nothing to do with that. But unfortunately, sometimes the damage may be done. And so these are going to be big traumatic wounds. Tourniquets are often going to be required um, to control bleeding with these. And usually why people die from shark attacks is because they bleed out in the water. And we've had a couple of deaths here over the last 10 years um, of folks who've, who've been bitten um, who, and basically been massive trauma from the, the bleeding. Honestly, for me, sharks don't scare me that much. I hang out in the water with sharks every day. And, you know, they, we keep our space, they keep theirs. And the odds of me bit, being shark bit is pretty low. The thing that really scares me in the water is this guy on the right, who's tiny. And this is the Irukandji jellyfish. Um, hangs out in the Indo-Pacific, which luckily I don't spend as much time in. Um, but you can see just you know a few centimeters across and translucent. And so almost impossible to see and to recognize. And this wound right here is an Irukandji jellyfish sting. Also does not look that impressive compared to our shark wound. But here's the thing, Irukandji's paralytic, and also can cause Irukandji syndrome, which is a massive catecholamine uh, release, can cause uh, significant hypertension, pulmonary edema, um, cardiac arrest. And so I'm a lot more scared of this guy that's going to put me on a ventilator or cause me to go into cardiac arrest than my friend the shark here. And so size does not necessarily matter uh, when it comes to marine venom issues. But these are fairly rare occurrences that we deal with. The far more common is what I see what we have here on my surface slides. Um, and so there's two common envenomations that I see both on the Southern California coast and honestly, US, uh, national, nationwide. And that is uh, stabbing envenomations and stinging envenomations. So think about stabbing envenomations with stingrays, with urchins, 